exciting day today. Tracking the very last guitar part for our first single. Uh, the person with the keys isn't here yet, so I'm sitting in my car outside the gate to the studio. Let's talk about money. So here in California, we've been dealing as artists with the fallout of uh, Assembly Bill Number 5, which is a freelance workers' rights bill, which sounds in concept like a very good idea. And it is for a lot of people. It helps out folks that work for Uber and Lyft, makes them have to be employees with benefits. But the problem is it is painted with a very wide brush. And uh, what that means for musicians is that we now have, if you have a band, now you have to have all of your, your bandmates as employees. So um, we're, we're figuring out what that means and what that looks like. Um, it's totally shaking up the gig economy and in a lot of ways that's a good thing, but uh, in a lot of other ways that's kind of making freelancers' lives a living nightmare. So it's got me thinking about some other things, especially like the kind of, the question about, you know, the state of the arts right now. We're looking at how hard it is to, to make money off of gigs, to get booked as a band, to to make a record, to make any money off of album sales. This is all stuff that's kind of hard these days. But, you know, how bad is it really? That cell phone video is the first half of a two-part story about my weekend. I was going to upload stuff on Friday, and then, as you'll see, my weekend was pretty crazy, and I didn't get a chance to upload it until Monday. That said, after the weekend that I had, I want to sort of redo this video anyway and add some other insights that I had. So there's been a lot of talk and concern in California about what AB5 is going to do to musicians living and working in California as freelancers. Um, the music industry itself is sort of built around the idea that you are employing yourself. To have to become a business the way that big corporations are businesses is a very painful learning curve. And the administrative costs of running a business that way will eat up whatever small overhead a lot of bands even bring in from their shows. So it is a tough spot. So I want to think about money in a bunch of different ways in this video. I want to think about how much it costs to make music, then how much you make playing music, and then how bad that is in the context of history. So let's start with the question, how much does music actually cost? About a year ago, YouTuber Adam Neely made the case that music actually has never cost anything. So historically, that's been sound recordings, that's been printed music, that's been hiring someone to write out music for you in manuscript form. In the 16th century, for example, the cost of a book was predominantly the cost of the paper. It wasn't the cost of the contents. And oftentimes, just like now, musicians would have to shoulder the cost of producing the book before it went to market. And unless you had a patron to bankroll that for you, you could be stuck with a hefty loss if people didn't buy it. Historically, musician jobs are also very vulnerable to inflation. In the 17th century, for example, after the Civil War in England, um, a lot of court musicians returned to their posts, but because of rampant inflation, their their salary, which was the same as before the war, didn't even like keep up with their living expense. So just because you had a patron, even if it's the King of England, it doesn't mean you had job security. The rent always goes up, and the pay does not. And as someone who has played shows in one of the most expensive cities on the planet, I know that dice roll feeling when you book a show and you hope that even though it's a Thursday night and it's raining and the flu is going around, that people will still come. Enter Saturday night's show. The other half of my creative life is running an arts organization called Sub Rosa Sound, and one of our main activities is putting on concerts. And we've had very successful shows, and we've also had some shows that maybe could have been more successful. Well, Saturday night was a runaway hit. It's the first time that we actually sold out the show. And it was a great show. The band had fantastic energy. There were puppeteers and acrobats and dancers. It was interactive. Everyone was dancing. So watching this show come together from the inside actually gives me a lot of hope. It was a lot of hard work and it was a lot of strategizing about marketing and kinds of things that I'd never had to do before. But I learned a lot through that process and it makes me hopeful for the future.
So I want to take these lessons from the successful show and use them in other areas of my career. So my plan with all of this is that I'm going to kind of take you along with me as we kind of start from square one to build up the band and the organization into powerhouses that can sustain themselves. We're going to crunch the numbers on this successful show and we're going to look at how much we spent versus how much we made, strategize for next time, look at the things that were the most helpful and the things that maybe we didn't need to do and we don't need to worry about for next time. And all of this is going to be in the service of making sure that each show we do after this has the same kind of energy and momentum that we had in a successful one. Because now that I've got a taste for that, I want more of it. And I want more people to have that too. So that's the plan. And now that you know the plan, you can go tell the plan to somebody else. Make sure to like and subscribe. And I will see you next week. I don't know. I think if you're late, you should bring bagels and coffee. Bagels and coffee.